I want to go to the word today, and the word that we have today is how do you handle interruptions? Yes, sir. All right. Look at the person next to you and ask them that question. How do you handle interruptions? Now, I could go to the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus Christ, and could pick almost every moment of his life because his life was full of constant interruptions. Yes. Everywhere he went, people wanted to see him, wanted him to do something for him. Can you heal my son? Can you heal my daughter? Can you do this miracle for me? Everywhere he went, mm -hmm. he was interrupted. People broke in on him. And when you have the presence of God in your life, you've got to expect that the servant is not greater than the master. If it happened to Jesus, look at somebody and say, it's going to happen to you. When people think that you got what they need, when people think that you can get a prayer through to God, they're going to come to you even in the middle of the night and say, sister, would you pray for me? Brother, would you pray for me? I've prayed. Uh, but it's something about when you pray. Right. Things happen. That's right. So interruptions are part of the normal scenery in life. Yes. But for the sake of time, I want to go to a man who we've been studying from, mm -hmm. from the book of Job, who went through all of life's major interruptions consecutively. Yes. Now to have 10 children to die at once, that's enough to blow a whole lot of folks out the water. Yeah. And for so many people, the shortest nerve in the body is the brain to the back pocket. You let them lose all their money and see where their faith is. But to go through even the highest interruption, somebody say skin for skin. Skin for skin. After the devil tested him with the children and tested him uh, uh, with his wealth, the devil says, well, I tell you what, touch his body. And he'll crush you to your face. And God had so much trust and belief in Job, he allowed the enemy so that you and I could have an example of somebody to follow to go through life's major interruption, skin for skin. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says, there's nothing else we can do. It's just a matter of time before you're going home to be with the Lord. That's life's highest interruption. I have a friend, my niece's father, who had open heart surgery over the weekend. And if you don't know anything about open heart surgery, you gotta understand something that life can go smooth for many days, many weeks, many months, many years, many scores, and then all of a sudden comes the interruption of sickness. Well. And just from a financial standpoint, you gotta understand that one open heart surgery can cost you anywhere from 80,000 to several hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And if you got your faith and trust in material things, even though you got a nest egg set aside, how much know that one doctor's operation can wipe you out? Yeah. Oh, yes. And you're starting all over again. Yeah. So you can't put your trust in money, you gotta put your trust in God. A man and a woman can, 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 can get together and, and, and they can have a relationship and they can create a marriage and have children and things can be going great for years and all of a sudden one wild night of passion can cost a lifetime of pain. And all of a sudden, divorce knocks rudely on the door. And not only are the man and the woman affected, but all the children are affected. It's one of the hardest things in life for children to overcome, to see mama and daddy no longer being together again. A boy and a girl can have big plans to do things in life, to, to make a mark that won't be erased. And, and the boy can have plans to, to be a doctor or, or she can have plans to be a lawyer. Then all of a sudden, the war knocks rudely on the door. And we have 18-year-olds that just graduate from high school. And the next thing you know, in two months later, they're over in another country with a gun in their hand. 
fighting a war that could have been not fought had our leaders learned to collaborate instead of escalate. And God wants you to know that in this world, life is full of interruptions. I need not remind you that interruptions can be expensive and they can be very, very costly. Oh yeah, we hear about the divorces that people go through and, and the settlement was 250 million and I read one yesterday what a 1.2 billion dollar settlement in a divorce, but that's not the real heart of it because it's in the spiritual realm. That's so much more than the financial realm that interruptions are costly. Anybody that's living their life for this world, they, they make this world a God and they think that money is everything to them. But how many know money can buy a house, but it can never make a home? Right. It'll give you that king size bed, but it will never give you a good night's sleep. And God is trying to say that in this world today, one of the biggest things that you've got to know how to do is to know how to deal with costly interruptions. There's an interruption in history that scholars are still debating on today. It happened with the poet, the poet Coleridge, who was at his desk and he was writing a poem called Kubla Khan, and as he was writing, how much have ever been writing in the spirit of the Lord is on you and the thoughts are unfolding and it's so good and you know that this is gonna be one of the best things you've ever done and you don't want nothing to interrupt you but all of a sudden somebody knocked on the door and it was so good he didn't want to be disturbed. He said, I'm gonna let them leave because I want to stay here and finish this because people are gonna be so blessed by that. But the person would not leave. He kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And finally, Coolidge went to the door and he said, what is it? He was trying to get back to his table and he, the man kept talking and talking and talking and talking. He said, please, what is it, what is it? And finally, when the man left, he went back to his desk. But he could never capture it because he was interrupted. And Coleridge wrote some great poems, but he said, all the world is the loser because I thought this was gonna be the best one that I ever done, but it was never finished because I was interrupted. And God wants you to know that in this world that we're living in today, you're either in an interruption, you just got out of an interruption, or you about to go through an interruption. And one of the greatest things you can learn from God's word is how can I handle life's interruptions? The door that slammed shut. The relationship that didn't work out. The, 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 the email from hell. Anybody else got one of them emails? And then all of a sudden it had a virus on it. Then all of a sudden you got to totally revamp what you're doing. They're a part of the normal scenery of life. And God wants you to be prepared because he wants you to expect them, but also to be prepared for them. Yes. Instead of putting an ambulance on the bottom of the cliff, God wants you to put a barricade on the edge of the cliff with the word of God. Amen. So we learned last week after losing his 10 children, after losing his wealth, Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I'll leave. Do I have anybody today that can say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Okay, Amma, blessed be the name. Okay, Harvey, blessed be the name of the Lord. If the Lord gave it to me, and if he chose for it to be taken away, I'm still going to give God praise. And when the devil comes back the second time, somebody say, skin for skin. Oh, yes, we go days, weeks, months, and years with good health, but all of a sudden you can just go for a, a brief checkup. Yeah. And the doctor says, we need you to come back real quick. We saw something on an x-ray. Yeah. Well. And all of a sudden, he's telling you that your life is never going to be the same. God wants to know whose report shall you believe. Do I have anybody that's going to believe the report of the Lord? You can be doing
doing a good thing and sometimes bad things can happen to you. I heard the testimony last week, uh, an interruption, praise from Sister Valerie. You can be at home minding your own business and all of a sudden you hear a boom. And you go outside and that boom has happened to you because somebody has hit your vehicle and they didn't stick around to give you license and insurance. And all of a sudden you're dealing with an interruption. Now there are three basic ways that most people try to deal with life's interruptions. And I want to submit to you two of them are, are the wrong way because they are the, the negative ways. The first way that so many people try to deal with life's interruptions, uh, when things happen to them, even though God has blessed them with many months and days and weeks and years of blessings, but as soon as something bad happened to them, you ever seen somebody that become mean? Become angry, yeah. be, get bitter, yeah. question God, start asking God, how could God let this happen to me? If God really was a good God, how could he let this happen to me? And I love what one of the mothers would say, Mother Raw, she's in heaven with God right now, but if anybody got on their pity pot and started whining and complaining and need some cheese to go with that wine, you ever been around somebody needs some cheese to go with that wine? <laughs> She said, baby, they nailed Jesus on the cross. What make you think you so special? That's right. That you can't go through nothing in your life. As long as God bless you, you happy as a lark. You telling people God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And God, if you never did another thing, uh, you've done enough. And the least little bitty thing happened. Well, yeah. People be at the complaint counter. Whining and complaining to God, questioning God's wisdom, questioning God's judgment, getting offended by his ways or whatever he allows to be. And if you got into the word of God, you'd understand from the book of Job that there are many things that God gets blamed for that he didn't do. It wasn't God that, uh, that, 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 that caused Job's ten children to die. It wasn't God that, that took all of his health away. Somebody tell me who he was. It was the enemy, Satan. You got to read the word of God. So much is, happens in life, it's mistaken identity. And people begin to question God when it wasn't really him in the first place. Now, nothing can happen in this world unless God allows it. But it's the difference between allowing it and doing it. If God allows it, he has a reason, like with Job, the reason he allowed it, so that you would have a blueprint, so that you would have a road map, so that you would have a way to get through your interruptions by studying his life and say that if he can go through 10 children to pass at once. If he can lose all of his wealth at once, at least I can be strong when my baby is sick. Yeah, at least I can be strong if I get laid off off of a job. Well, yeah. And I can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. But I see so many people, they have the least little bitty thing happen to them and they become mean angry they become bitter and later on when their health issues get bad they don't realize that the reason that so many of them are struggling through health problems is because they're harboring the unforgiveness and bitterness in their bodies see doctors tell us this and this is one good thing we can learn from doctors that hatred and bitterness is much worse than acid unforgiveness is much worse than acid it does more to the vessel in which it is stored than the object on which it is poured you can be angry how you wanted somebody because they treated you like a dirty dog but you're the one that's going to have ulcers you're the one that's going to be drinking Pepto-Bismol at night so we can't afford to deal with life's interruptions by being mean and angry and bitter. These people fail to realize that interruptions are part of the normal scenery in life. 
Like the ever flowing waters of the river, life has moments of flood and it has moments of drought. Like the ever changing cycle of the season, life has the piercing chill of winter and the smoothing warmth of summer. And if you think every day is going to be summer and spring, just keep living. Because sooner or later, the interruptions are coming your way. There's not one person in here that hadn't gone through something in their life. But if you never had the problem, how are you going to learn that with God's help, you can solve them? And he wants you to understand that getting angry and upset, you ask some people, well, when did you have this bad relationship? When did she do this to you 10 years ago? And you still got wrinkles in your forehead from 10 years ago? You still walking around looking like the cruise director for the Titanic with something that happened 10 years ago? You still get high blood pressure every time somebody calls that person's name from a decade ago? And the Lord would say to you today, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting. That's why we have to remind you that unforgiveness is one of the worst things you can do in your life. It's like drinking poison and hoping the person that hurts you gets sick. Now how stuck on stupid is that? I'm going to do something that's going to purposely hurt me. I'm going to think about this over and over again and that you've been taught every negative thought is a bad thing that's put in your body. It's a cancer cell. Now, it's not going to give you cancer, but if you just constantly get diseased with stinking thinking and all you focusing on is what I've lost and not looking at what you've got left. If you're going around counting your blessings on your fingertips, but your problems on a pocket calculator. If you're looking at what you've lost and not giving God glory for what you got left. And as long as you got King Jesus. As long as you got King Jesus, how much know it's already all right? Right. Quit focusing on material things because material things are not what life is all about. If he gave it to you before, he can give it to you again. But learn how to worship God. Do I have anybody that made up your mind no matter what happened, you're going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. So we can't allow the devil to steal our joy just because interruptions come our way. After people react to interruptions, and you know I'm going with this, when a person reacts to things, if you go to the doctor and you react to something, the doctor says it's bad. But if he give you medication and you respond to it, somebody say that's great. And that's what God is expecting from all of his children. Don't get negative. Don't become mean, angry, or bitter. The second way that people try to deal with interruptions. You ever seen a person that becomes introvert? They withdraw. They quit. They give up on life. Had one bad relationship and you ask them about men. Tell us about men. Oh, all men are dogs. Wait a minute, you had one bad relationship. You're the one that like bad boys. God didn't tell you about bad boys, but no, I like a bad boy. I don't like a good man. I want somebody that can handle me. Handle yourself. All of a sudden, you done messed up your credit and you mad at all men. If we would kick the person that's causing us the most of our problems, it's our own behinds that we be starting with. It can be the same me with men, praise God. Uh, a man can have one bad relationship and they're telling us about all this stuff that somebody did to them and this stuff happened too long ago. you still holding on. You didn't give up on life. These people can't get excited about the majestic sounds of great music. You can hear a great worship song and they're sitting around with a smile on their face, looking like they weaned on a pickle. 
baby come in the church and if you can't get excited about the charm and touch of a beautiful newborn baby you know your heart has gotten too hard because God put babies in our lives to help us to have joy babies are innocent they haven't done any hurt to anybody get this baby out of my face <laughs> I wouldn't be there I know babies and these people they just give up on life When they think, they just think of me, myself, and I. I'm going to put myself in a cage, and I'm not going to let nobody ever hurt me, and I'm not going to get involved with no other relationship again, because relationships are too much trouble. And it's like a person, they, what did the cat learn to sit on the stove? And the lesson was don't sit on a hot stove, but so many people say, never sit on a stove again. And they sang in that Dionne Warwick thing. So I'll never fall in love again. Well, that was your problem. You fell in love instead of growing in love. You tried to make it happen instead of letting it happen with God. And God is saying that you got to understand that life has moments of flood. It's got moments of drought. And you can't allow yourself to get hard when you're going through stuff in life. When the manufacturers of automobile tires, when they first would make tires like on the Model T, they tried to make a tire that was stiff and hard. And you've seen those old tires that they put on the Model T's. But as soon as that tire would hit the rocks and the bumps in the road, that tire ended up tearing up all over the road. How much of you have been driving down the street and you've seen tires that go to pieces? But they went back to the drawing board and they created a radio tire. And you know the difference between those tires and a radio tire? The radio tire is able to bend with the bumps and, and give a little, praise God, when it rolls over the rocks. And those tires are still on the road today. And God is saying when you're going through interruptions, you've got to be able to bend with the storm but not break. Right. The strongest trees in the forest are the ones that, that, that are not on the inside that are being protected from all the wind, but it's the ones on the outside that's catching all the wind, catching all the rain, but they learn how to be strong. And God is saying, if you trust me even when you can't trace me, no matter what comes by the will of God, it shall be met by the grace of God. But you've got to make up your mind instead of saying, why me, Lord? Do I have any use me, Lord, children in here today? How can I give you glory in this situation that happens in my life? No, it doesn't look good. No, it doesn't feel good. No, it didn't taste good. When people are going around talking behind your back or criticizing you or trying to condemn you when they don't know the facts. Job had three friends that went to him and for seven days they didn't say a word. And we celebrate them for going that long because so many folks, praise God, are running their mouth already trying to tell you what's happening when they don't know all the facts. They open up their mouth and they begin to talk about Job. Now, Job, if you really was the good man that you say you were, you wouldn't be going through all of these things. You know, they try to equate life in a nutshell, like any philosophy that can be put in a nutshell, it ought to be. Because life is not to be explained. Life is to be lived. Do you realize that there are people in this world that never smoke a cigarette in their life that will get lung cancer. Yeah. And there will be people who smoke like a train and never get lung cancer. There are some people that drink like a river. They drink every day in their life and you go like, how is his liver still functioning? And some people that never touch a drink and all of a sudden they go to the doctor and They've been diagnosed with liver cancer. God is trying to let you know that life is to be lived, not explained. And quit trying to explain things like Job's friends were doing. They wanted to help and they did good by going to be with Job and waiting on Job. But when they opened up their mouth, they were given the wrong answers to the problem. Because in life, sometimes, bad things can happen to good people. In life, sometimes you can be trying to do good and bad will come your way. 
doubt. We need to quit trying to know why stuff happened. Why is a waste of time? When, it, when Job had 10 children to pass away, with knowing why they passed away, would that have brought them back to the dinner table? They still would have been gone. If you didn't know why the Chaldees raided him and took all of his camels, he still was going to be broke. What we need in the time of trouble is not an answer. We need the answer. And God is the answer in the time of need. He's the one person in our life that will never leave us, nor forsake us. And as long as you got King Jesus, as long as you got King Jesus, it's already all right. Armor can come, and harbor can grow, and people can come, and they can go. But as long as you build your foundation on the rock of God's word, you're going to be able to stand. So the way to deal with him is not by getting mean and angry and bitter. The way to deal with him is not by questioning God's wisdom and questioning his judgment or getting offended by his ways or whatever he allows to be. You got to understand something about God. Somebody say God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That simply means he's God all by himself. He can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants and he can bring you in the world and he can take you out he can make another one look just like you so it's a wise person is not going to question God's wisdom they're not going to question God's judgment they're not going to be offended by God's ways or whatever God allows to be because he is God alone and after he gave his son's life to save our life while we were still yet sinners, we ought to know in our heart that whatever comes by the will of God, yes, it shall be met by the grace of God. He's too wise to make a mistake. He's too good to be unjustly unkind. He's too deep to be explained, and he's too great not to be God all by himself. But you got to trust him, even when you can't trace him. And you're not going to be able to trace him, because his ways are so much higher than our ways. You see, we are so caught up into being comfortable, but God is concerned about your character. What's going to help you to become Christ-like? What's going to help you grow up to be all of thee and none of me? And if you ask yourself honestly, what has brought you closer to God? Was it God's blessings or was it burdens that he allowed to happen in your life? With most folks until they grow up, y'all, you can't even give them two house notes paid in advance. You ever seen somebody that starts seeing the way? All of a sudden, okay, God, we got it now. We can handle it now. I, mean, I got a little money in the bank now. I'll call you when I need you. And all of a sudden, God becomes a spur tire on the road to life. You see them when they buy a new car, they got... God is my co-pilot. And you know that about your father. He does not do co-pilot. Right. If he doesn't have the wheel, somebody say no, no deal. deal. And we learn, praise God, that we serve a father who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten sons for us. And that ought to be enough to say whatever comes my way. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to charge you foolishly. I'm not going to go around whining and complaining at the complaint counter. But I'm going to respond and not react. So the way to deal with him is not by being mean and angry. The way to deal with him is not by reacting. There is a better way a more healthy way, a positive way that you make the change pay and produce to add new height 
to your stature. The major problem is learning how to deal with costly interruptions. The question is, what are you going to do when these things happen your way? You saw what Job did. He worshiped God and he praised God. You saw what Paul did even in the Philippian jail when he was chained and put into a dungeon and he was beat and Simon says, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? And according to Pastor Webb and his version says, Paul says to Silas, my name begin with a P, I'll start to praying. Your name begin with an S, you start to singing. The Bible simply says they prayed and they sang. And when you start praying and you start singing, the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. But you got to grow up from being a part-time praiser. I praise you when my pockets got them up. I praise you when my children are doing good. I praise you when my relationship is right to be a full-time worshiper. God, if I don't have the job, I praise you. If my health is not perfect, I praise you. If the children are not acting all right, I praise you. Because as long as I got Jesus, that's enough. God wants to know, what are you going to stretch your wing for? Are you going to grow wings or grab crutches? Yes. Are you going to look at what you lost or what you got left? Some of us have gone through interruptions already. When I think of interruptions, I think of a boy and a girl that was climbing up a mountain. And the way was getting rough. And the girl says to her brother, I thought you said this was a smooth path to this mountain. All I see is a bunch of rocks and a bunch of bumps. And he looked at his little sister, he said, sweetheart, it's the bumps that help you climb the mountain. Yeah, yeah. Look back over your life, praise God. It's those bumps that help turn you to God. Oh, yeah. You had to face something in your life where you couldn't see the way for you to finally get out of the way and let God have his way so he could make a way out of no way. And as I look back over my life and I think things over, what I thought was the worst thing ended up being one of the best things. But you got to see it from a heavenly viewpoint. People who are looking at earth as their home, they don't understand God's ways. God is trying to prepare us for eternity. And whatever will help you to become Christ-like, he's willing to allow it to happen. So when you're dealing with interruptions, I'm reminded of a man who had a beautiful home on the edge of a river and he really loved this home and he had it fixed up so meticulously. It was so beautiful, but like anybody else, you go days and weeks and months, some people are dealing with harvest, some dealing with uh, 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 the for out of situation right now, one day it began to rain. And the rain came all the way up to the edge of his house and it seeped into his basement where he was raising some chickens. So early the next morning he went to his landlord. He said, I'm going to move. The landlord said, move? You told me last week how much you love this house. He said, yes, I do, but it's so situated. It drowned all my chickens. She looked up and she said, why don't you try ducks this time? Well, uh... <laughs> And that's the way life goes. Sometimes you gotta try ducks. You gotta try something different. If you keep doing what you're doing, you keep getting what you're getting. Try ducks. Turn it up again. Have you ever seen a little duck swimming across a lake? It looks like he's just cruising or she's just cruising across the lake, but if you could see their little hands under the water, yeah. they're, doing, yeah. <laughs> they're doing everything they can to get across the water. And sometimes you got to try ducks. Yeah. Sometimes you got to take it up a notch. Yeah. Sometimes you got to say, if God leads me to it, he's going to see me through it. Yes, he will. But you can't give up. Yeah. You can't give in. Yeah. And you can't give out. That's why the Apostle Paul said, for this cause we faint not. There's no such thing as quit for a child of God. We trust him, even when we can't trace him. 
when I think of interruptions, I think of a man who was set up to be married. And his wedding day came. He went to the church. His bride didn't show up. He was jilted by his fiance. His heart was broken. He was bewildered. He started getting depressed. So he went to the Henley Bridge in Knoxville and he wrote a suicide note. To whom it may concern, I don't feel that nobody loves me. And the woman that I love most of all, she just jilted me. Therefore, I'm gonna jump. And sadly, he did jump. He took his life. But on the very next page in that same newspaper that told the story of another man who was jilted by his girlfriend, she didn't show up to the church. His heart was broken. He was bewildered. He started to getting depressed, but he went into a room and he started thinking about it. And he got a pen and paper and he wrote a song called Good Night Irene and he ended up making $75,000 off of that song. <laughs> So when change in life come, don't jump. Produce your song. Go somewhere and find that extra gear. Find that something on the inside of you that refused to give up on life, that refused to give up on people just because you had one experience that didn't work out. When God was really trying to save you from what you was about to do because you was joining yourself together instead of him putting you together. Well. You've got to understand something. Life is full of all kinds of interruptions. But you've got to learn how to make change pay and produce. When I think of interruptions, I think of a man by the name of Thomas Darcy. If you know anything about Thomas Darcy, he was a great songwriter and he was an evangelist. He used to travel all over. But one day he was getting ready to speak at a music conference and he got a telegram that said, you need to come home, your wife just died. And when he got home, not only had his wife died, but the little baby that she was pregnant with died also. His life would never be the same. He was heartbroken and he was bewildered. He started to get a little sad, but he went into a room and he grabbed a pencil and paper and all of a sudden these words came to his mind, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. Help me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. And Brother Dawson said, I'm so glad I didn't do what I thought I was going to do because everywhere he would go afterwards, he couldn't even go to a church before he would leave. You know what somebody had to say? Before you leave. Would you please do that precious Lord song? And I'm so glad that he was able to use the interruption to make the change pay and produce for all of us to be blessed by. Well. Dr. Martin Luther King, one of my heroes, as I wrap this up. God had called him to try to make things better for all of us. And one day he was working and he came home late at night and in the middle of the night, a voice on the other end of the phone said, nigga, if you ain't out of town in three days, we gonna blow your head off and your house down. Dr. King said he had heard that type of stuff hundreds of times from some of our sick white brothers, and, and that never affected him because how many know until God get ready for you to go, ain't nothing gonna kill you? Right. And when he get ready for you to go, ain't nothing gonna keep you? Right. So he said it never affected him, but this was the one time in his life that, that, that the voice on the other end was 
was getting to him, and, and he got out of the bed, and he went and uh, 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 warmed up some coffee, and, and he was saying, Lord, why are people sick like this even today, praise God, when our brothers are not black, and our blacks are not brothers, and, and, and then all of a sudden, as he was there, he got on his knees, and, and, and the voice spoke to him and says, you can't call on your mama now. You can't call on your daddy now. You got to call on the one that your mama and daddy told you about. I'm talking about the one that'll make a way out of no way. I'm talking about the one that'll turn your dark night into a bright tomorrow. I'm talking about the one that'll carve a tunnel of hope through the mountain of despair. And Dr. King said he prayed a prayer that night. And he said, no matter what comes to me, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to deal with this interruption in my life. I'm not going to allow it to make me bitter. I'm going to allow it to make me better. I'm not going to look at what I have lost. I'm going to look at you because you're what I have left. And whatever comes to me by the will of God, it shall be met by the grace of God. If you can receive it, give God praise today. Hallelujah, Father. Father, we come before you today. Many of us are going through interruptions right now. Somebody is dealing with armor right now. Somebody is still dealing with Harvey right now, God. Yes, Lord. But we lift them up to you in prayer. Yes, God. Not for them to become mean, angry, and bitter. Not for them to question your wisdom or question your judgment. Yes. But let them trust you even when they can't trace you. Somebody ready to give up right now, Father God. They become introvert. They're withdrawing. They're ready to lose their zest for life. They're ready to no longer try. But Father, give them a spirit for this cause we faint not. Give them a heart to keep on keeping on. To trust you, Father, to work this together for good. Even though it may not look good, feel good, taste good, or smell good, we stand on your promise that you will work it together for good. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Give God a praise offering.